Well, good morning. Some of you are like, man, that was short. Best service ever. No, we're going to do some worship at the end. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to have those guys come back up a little bit later. Um, my name is Greg. If I haven't met you, I'm one of the pastors here. Um, Pastor Dave and Claire, they're actually gone celebrating their 20-year wedding anniversary. And so, yeah, man, we love those guys and bless them. Hope that they have an, uh, man, just an awesome time away. Uh, but, man, I am thrilled to be able to speak to you guys this morning. One of the things I love about Life Church is it's got so many incredible teachers of God's Word. And I don't consider myself one of them, but I'm going to take a whack at it today, and we'll see what happens. You know, like many of you, I love this time of year. I mean, I love Christmas. I love it all. I love the, the lights. I love the decorations. I love the parties, the cookies, the eggnog, the exchanging of gifts. I mean, I love Christmas. But there's one thing that gets me in the Christmas spirit like nothing else will, and that's Christmas music. I mean, my kids will tell you, like, since about Thanksgiving, my truck, the radio in my truck's been set at 106.9, and I've been listening to Christmas music for weeks now. But man, I was kind of curious, and this is kind of the audience participation part of the service. I'd love to hear, what are some of y'all's favorite Christmas songs? You can just shout them out. Joy to the World, yeah. We just, oh, Holy Night. Little Drummer Boy. Yeah. Thank you. So last service, was the same thing. It was like everybody was like, it was some highly spiritual Christmas songs. And somebody's like, Grandma got ran over by a reindeer. I was like, yes. Thank you. You know, when I was a kid, my, my favorite as a little child, my favorite song was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer because it had that little echo part. You know what I'm talking about? And you always felt like you, know, you weren't supposed to do it, but you did it. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose. Yeah, I love that as a kid. But as I've gotten older, I've come to realize there's one song to me that gets me in the Christmas spirit. I mean, it just oozes Christmas, and that is Nat King Cole singing the Christmas song, Right? Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. I mean, I'm just like, yes, Christmas. Love it. But listen, this truly is a magical time of the year. And I believe here's why. Because it seems like this time of year, kind of the whole world pauses and kind of recognizes Jesus for who he is. And it's like no other time of the year, because, man, right now you can go into a grocery store, you can go to the mall, it's on, man, the radio in your car, you come home, it's on TV, you see people who normally never would, they're singing in, about Jesus. I mean, it's truly an amazing time of the year. We're in this series called A Few of My Favorite Things, and what we're doing is we're taking a look at the deeper spiritual meanings behind some of our favorite Christmas traditions. And for me, one of my favorite is Christmas music, but listen, at the root of Christmas music is the worship of Jesus Christ as Lord. And today, that's what I do. I want to take a look at worship through the lens of Christmas. But you first need to kind of understand, listen, this first point, worship, true biblical worship, what it is, is, man, it's our response to God's revelation, Worship is man's response to God's revelation. You see, all throughout the scripture, all throughout history, you see God will reveal himself and man responds in worship. And if you think about it that way, listen, there is no greater revelation of God than the incarnation. There's no greater revelation of God than the birth of Jesus. Because it's where God came to this earth, put on flesh, and walked among us. Which means, man, listen, there, nothing should inspire us to worship more than celebrating Christmas. Man, so this morning, what I want to do is I want to take a look at a couple of stories that we find in the Bible. Some of the earliest Christmas worship moments. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. Yeah. 
Luke chapter 2. And so let me, I'm just going to kind of give you the Cliff Notes version of what's happened up to this point in Luke chapter 2. So Joseph and Mary, they go to Bethlehem. There's no room for them in the end. They end up going to the stable. Jesus is born. And there's, there's these shepherds watching sheep kind of outside of Jerusalem, or outside of Bethlehem, close by. And these angels appear. And these shepherds are scared to death. And the angels are like, hey, don't be scared. I'm just here to tell you, Jesus, or the Messiah, has been born. Jesus has been born. Then all of a sudden, more angels show up, and they start singing, glorifying, and praising God. And that's where we pick up here in verse 15. So it says, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Listen, the first thing I want you to pull out of the story is, listen, worship should be a priority. It says when, when those angels came to the shepherds and told them what had happened, those shepherds, they didn't just go, yeah, we get around to it, we'll go check it out. What did he say? They said they hurried off. There was a sense of urgency, right? They didn't wait. This was a priority. This was important to the point where, listen, they left the sheep. I mean, if you're a shepherd back in this time, the one thing you never, ever, ever do is leave the sheep. But, man, they left it. They dropped everything and they went because, man, it was a priority. Listen, the same way, man, we should have that same sense of urgency when it comes to worshiping God. It should be a priority to us. After all, listen, it's what we're made for. It's why we're here. We are here to worship. Man, A.W. Tozer says this, You will be worshiping long after everything else has ceased to exist. That is what you are here for, to glorify God and enjoy Him thoroughly and forever, telling the universe how great God is. Listen, this should be our number one priority. Some of you say, man, I'm, Greg, I'm not really into the whole singing thing. Not really a worshiper. Man, whether you think so or not, listen, you are a worshiper. Because it's hardwired into us. We're all worshipers. We all worship something. The problem is, so many of us, we take that spot that's to be rightly held by God and we place it and fill it with other things. Some of us, man, we worship our kids. Some of us, we worship our careers, our stuff. And what happens is, worshiping God, man, it just becomes less and less and less of a priority. To the point that, man, even man, our most committed followers of Jesus are like, yeah, if there's nothing else going on this weekend, I'll come to church and worship. There's no soccer, no baseball. NFL's not on. Man, listen, it should be our number one priority because it's what we're here for. We're here to worship. Second thing you see in the, sh in the shepherds here is that, listen, worship requires active involvement. When the angels came and said, Jesus has been born, glory to God in the highest, the shepherds didn't sit there and go, yeah, I'll just stay here and imagine it. I'll imagine Jesus in the main. No, they got up and went, right? When they saw him, they glorified and praised him. Then they left and went and told everyone. And then they came back and worshiped him some more. Man, if you read between the lines, I bet those shepherds were pumped, right? I bet they couldn't contain it. Listen, all throughout Scripture's church, you see words like singing, Clapping, shouting, raising hands, dancing, weeping, rejoicing, laughing. Man, these are all active responses associated with worship. The shepherds didn't just stay there. They went. 
Man, it's a verb. It's something that we do. Man, listen, just like the shepherds, in the same way, listen, we should be pumped about worshiping. I can tell you this, listen, restraint, it's not the natural posture of a grateful heart. Restraint is not the natural posture of a saved heart. What if someone saved you from a building? How would you respond? I seriously doubt we'd go, well, I recognize your sacrifice and I give my thanks. No, we'd be a blubbering mess, wouldn't we? We'd be like crying and hugging this guy. Oh my. We'd be jumping up and down. He's so hard, you know, telling everyone about what had happened. I mean, in the same way, listen, our worship should be an overflow of our hearts that we cannot contain. You say, Greg, I'm not really an emotional person. I like to worship privately. Listen, there are times to sit in quiet reverence to God, but for the most part, he's not interested in secret admirers. <laughs> you don't have to love the music here. You just have to love Jesus. I think there's some Christians, man, they... They want us to believe that, yeah, I'm standing here with my arms crossed and a scowl on my face, but inside, I'm shouting praises to God. <laughs> I'm sitting here sipping coffee, but on the inside, I'm laid out on my face before the Lord. No, listen, the Bible says the mind, body, and soul, they're one, which means, listen, our worship, man, requires active involvement, the whole self. That's why we raise hands when we worship. And I can't explain it to you this morning, but I can tell you this. There's something special and powerful when we add a physical activity to what our heart is singing about. There's something very special about it. And if you've never done it, I want to encourage you to try it. I know it's hard. You're like, oh, everyone's looking at me. Oh. No, we're not. But there's something very powerful, listen, when we involve our whole self into worshiping the Lord. I love that this church worships passionately. I love that there's freedom here to worship, but man, sadly, it's like most churches that I've been to, man, you rarely see that natural response of a heart that's been saved. Man, it requires our active response. Listen, this, I'm going to take a look at a different story, a different account of some Christmas worship, and it's found in Matthew 2. So if you have your Bibles, hang a left. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 2. Verse 1 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared to them. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Now let me give you, let's pause here and give you a little bit of context. So you have these magi from the east. Now, we've also heard them called wise men, right? These wise men from the east. Some scholars believe that they were non-Jews, which... Is an awesome picture of kind of how, man, God wants all nations to worship him, right? But some scholars believe that these actually, the wise men were Jews, that they were descendants from Jews who had been exiled centuries before. And the reason why they believe that is because, man, these wise men were very familiar with Old Testament prophecy. But these, these, these magi, these wise men, they were philosophers and astronomers, and so apparently they were studying the skies and this star appeared. Now, it could have been more like a comet. We don't know. It was just some kind of astrological phenomenon that kind of informed them that the king of the Jews had been born, just like the prophecy had said. 
So they went to Jerusalem, which you're like, ah, kind of missed that. It was it actually happened in Bethlehem, but they went to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was the capital. That was like where the man, that's where the king was. So if there was a king born, it would naturally happen in Jerusalem. So these wise men, these magi from the east, showed up and they're like, "Where's this king that was born?" Well. The people of Israel believed that the promise of the Messiah was the promise of a warrior king who would bring, like, rebellion. And so when Herod hears this, he's not thrilled about it. So he tells these magi, he goes, I want you to go and search and find him. And when you find him, let me know so I can come worship him, which really he wanted to kill him. He didn't want to worship him. And so that's what's happening here. Look at verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now there's something want to point out first about the story. The first thing is that, listen, this journey that these magi, these wise men from the east took, scholars say that they, they basically came from what's modern-day Iran to Jerusalem, then headed south to Bethlehem. That in total, this was about a 900-mile journey. 900 miles. And there weren't planes, trains, or automobiles back then. Which means, listen, it took a while. And I don't mean to burst your Christmas bubble, but if you have a nativity scene at, at your house and the wise men are there, they weren't really there. Scholars say that Jesus was a toddler, probably about 18 months old by the time the wise men, these magi, arrived. But here's what I want you to get. Listen, that journey, 900 miles, that was a very long, hard and I'm sure expensive trip to make. But they did it anyways. They went in spite of the cost. What I want you to see this morning is, listen, worship requires sacrifice and surrender. Worship requires sacrifice and surrender. It's going to cost you something. One of my favorite verses, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Worship involves sacrifice. You may say, what does that mean to be a living sacrifice? Well, it comes from this idea of Old Testament temple worship where they offered sacrifices, but I'll just put it to you this way. Here's what happens. Listen, when I worship God, when I focus on him. I take the focus off of myself. And as I focus on him, man, I begin to die to my will, my wants, my desires. And listen, the more I die to myself, the more God is pleased. And the closer I can press in and come to him. That's what being a living sacrifice means. I mean, 1 Corinthians 1.29 says, No flesh will glory in his presence. And the problem is so many times, man, I reek of flesh, I reek of the things of this world and wonder why, man, God seems far away. Listen, worship involves sacrifice and surrender. That means living a life of worship doesn't allow for my sin nature to remain. Living a life of worship doesn't allow for me to walk around full of pride and selfishness. Living a life of worship doesn't allow for me to live life on my terms. Living a life of worship is about me laying my life down at his feet and dying to myself. There's a quote that says, The only thinkable relationship between us and God is one of full lordship on his part and complete submission on ours. You know, these wise men, I'm sure they had other plans. I'm sure there were other things to do. I'm sure it wasn't easy. 
I'm sure this trip cost them dearly. But man, they were willing to lay all of that aside so that they could stand in the very presence of God, look upon his face, and worship him. You know, it's amazing to me that we celebrate Christmas with consumerism whenever the whole act of worship is about dying to ourselves. That was a little extra nugget there, free of charge. So. I mean, it requires sacrifice, surrender. Let's look back at verse 11, Matthew 2. It says, on coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Listen, these wise men, they didn't come to get something. They came to give. They worshiped by presenting their gifts to Jesus. And the last point this morning is this. Listen, worship is for God. I know that sounds very elementary, but <laughs> we need to let that soak in. Worship is for God. Although we're blessed by it, although we benefit from it, listen, it's not for us. It's for him. I've been leading worship for over 20 years. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people over the years who wanted to inform me how I could better make worship suit them. It's too loud. It's not loud enough. I like the piano and the organ. I like the band. We want more guitars. I hate the guitars. More hymns, less hymns. I love the new music. I hate the new music. On and on and on and on. Listen, it's natural that we have preferences, stylistic preferences, things that we like and dislike. The problem is, listen, our personal preferences have no spiritual value here. Because it's not for us. This is all for him it's crazy to me that people refuse to humbly bow before Almighty God because their preferential demands aren't being met. Man, what's worse, those of us who grew up in the church, we've seen the church fight over this thing. There's a term for it called worship wars. Seriously, people have written books about it. And fights over worship styles, man, they've split churches. They've caused people to act out in hate towards one another. And listen, the very thing that's meant to unify us and bless God is breaking the heart of God. Man, but it's easy for us to slip into that mindset, right? Where we think we're the consumer. We're the audience. Man, we've kind of, it's like nowadays, everybody, everywhere you go, everybody's Yelp reviews. I went to dinner, ah, three stars. Went to the movie, two stars. And we bring that in here. We've created a whole generation of professional worship critics. Listen, this isn't for us. We're not the audience. This is all for an audience of one. And because of who it's for, we bring the very best of what we have. We do things with excellence and intentionality. Because of who it's for. I mean, these wise men brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Listen, this was not stuff they just had laying around their tents. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This was incredibly expensive and lavish gifts. In fact, these were traditional gifts given to kings and royalty. When they came to worship Jesus... They bowed, and they gave him the very best of what they had. Man, I believe, listen, when we fully grasp who this is all for, it's going to radically change how we worship. When we fully wrap our heads around who we're doing this for, we'll no longer show up late, we'll no longer stand there disengaged, we'll no longer just go through the motions mouthing words. I believe when we realize who this is for, it'll forever change how our services look. Man, it'll change how you worship. Man, it's for him. 
I want to invite the worship team to come up. We're going to close a little bit different today. You know, the Christmas season, it's, it really is the most wonderful time of the year. Because it's like the whole earth is resonating with songs of worship. The whole earth is resonating with songs glorifying him, songs proclaiming the gospel. Man, and listen, this morning we have the opportunity to join with those shepherds and those wise men so many years ago and stand in the very presence of God and look upon his face and worship him. We're going to close by worshiping this morning. And listen, I'm a fast talker, so we got plenty of time. So don't rush off. Take this moment and worship him. Make it a priority. Man, actively engage. Lay yourself this morning at his feet and say, I am all yours. And take the focus off ourselves and shift the focus to him because this is all for him. Man, let's worship together this morning.